Security Unhappy Hour, where we bring together a group of security professionals and naturally cheery folks to discuss topics in the cybersecurity community, share knowledge, learn, teach, and exchange ideas. Now, before we get started, it's important to point out the views and opinions expressed on the Security Unhappy Hour and related websites are those of the hosts, guests, authors, and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any one company. Today, my co-hosts, Lisa Bradley, Katie Noble, Krobe, and I are going to talk about high-profile vulnerabilities. We have a special guest, Jen Davis, on to talk to us about her experiences with the chaos that high-profile security vulnerabilities can bring. Jen Davis has 20 years of enterprise class engineering and leadership experience. For the better part of the last nine years, she has focused on PCERT-related activities and the business policies and initiatives that impact PCERT, such as product lifecycle management and end-of-life support. And she is also awesome. So welcome, Jen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, my brother from another mother. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> Happy to be with you guys. Yes, it's so and wonderful. Yeah. So I think probably, you know, one of the first things that most people ask me is, what do you mean by high profile security vulnerabilities? What's the difference between that and say your normal run of the mill security vulnerability? Anybody want to take a poke at that? Special handling. It mm. hurts my soul. Or a special, <laughs> special handling. Uh, mm, those branded things that we all love. Oh, 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 my favorite is when they turn it into a YouTube video and sing and dance. Oh, about a security vulnerability? Yeah. An emoji? Did you see the ones with our emojis now? New trend. Emoji. So entertaining. Um, icons, PR, activity. Now, I'm, I don't mean to be rude because some of them are really amazing, amazing discoveries. But some of them are a little over the top. And to be fair, sometimes we create our own high profile vulnerabilities from within our own product code. Yeah, yes, you're right. Can't imagine that ever happening. But that doesn't I, feel I, real. Take, I take a little bit of exception about chaos as a descriptor. Yes, some high profile vulnerability situations are chaotic, but not all of them. I mean, there's, there's fundamental structure that you can put around your processes to help manage. So to use Lisa's moniker, it can be a controlled chaos, right? Whereas chaos sometimes implies completely lack of control. And I think at least the people on this call, you know, within what is within our realm to control, you know, we, we do a pretty fair job of it most of the time. Yeah, I think so. So I, I was thinking, I'm sorry, Crove, I'm, I'm interrupting you like usual. <laughs> I was thinking about um, when I first considered um, my first like high profile type of issue where I was like, oh my goodness, like this is this new world of something I didn't even know before. And I thought I was doing so well in the company I was at and I was like on my game. And then April 2014 hit. Come on, you know what it is. Oh, Heartbleed was your first one, wasn't it? Heartbleed, Heartbleed was my first one. And it was what made me have to alter everything that I thought about. I thought I was doing great. And then I was like, oh, wait, here's a new situation. That's when we started having new response policies after that, isn't it? You started yeah. putting more procedures in place. Yes. To help manage well, those. Yeah. Krobe, you were in the open, were you in the open source world then? Or were you in a different world? I was then? on the other side. I was a architect for a program manager for a C-cert at the time. Oh. So I got to see it from the other side. So sorry. And that's <laughs> the reason why I got hired where I am because of that problem. They need, we needed some additional assistance to help facilitate those things. Now, in all fairness, I will retract and say that one was pretty chaotic. Right, because it was one of the first ones. But I mean, it's weird to say now, though, that maybe it's not chaotic when there's a high profile type of issue because it, be. it, it still can be, but it's maybe we just start learning to deal with it. I don't know. Well, Josh, I saw you. 
your yeah the, the chaos is probably more perceived from uh, people on the outside on the inside we've developed a, a set of techniques and processes and skills to harness that like like you were saying john right this is about managing the chaos and we don't have the same reaction that we once had the same visceral reaction like with heartbleed right we had that going on and now we don't really have that as much oh katie's hand is going up okay so i have a fun story um oh all right <laughs> so uh uh yes i have a fun story and my story revolves around what you just said josh that like we manage it because we're like this is business as usual so um i worked at a u.s government agency uh, where I ran the vulnerability programs. And there is this thing called the Critical Vulnerability Action Protocol, which is basically where something very bad happens and you stand up this like response team and all of the federal agencies have like an hour to get on this CISO call. And basically then um, different agencies talk about like what's going on. And then you decide like you decide like how fast we need to like patch this. Like it's it's like a drop whatever you're doing, this is important. And there's like thresholds to meet that criteria. And so I, uh, there was a CVE that came out and it was CVE uh, 2019-0708. And uh, we saw it and we went, oh dear. And then we evaluated it and said, this is a CVAP. And so we started the CVAP process and the CISA, the um, Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency, stood up this, this CVAP and we went through this process and we basically patched it. Like all of the federal government agencies patched it like in a day. And it was like done and we were done. And we like put out an alert for like private sector and we, we did like all of these things to make sure that it was like disclosed. We prioritized the NIST scoring on it so that it could like flow into people's scanners really quickly. Um, and then three weeks later, you started seeing all of this news like press around it. And we're like, is this a zombie vulnerability? We're already done with this. Like, what is this? And uh, there was all this press about like, oh, well, you know, the, the US government and it was NSA puts out this reporting saying that this is a critical vulnerability and it needs to be patched immediately. And we're like, what are we chopped liver? Like we put out the same report like, like a month ago and said like, no, no, this, but the difference is it was CVE uh 2019 0708 for us and for nsa it was blue keep and because of the name difference everybody name. got all spin up all over again and it caused people to go completely crazy um and it had already been solved go ahead crow i was going to answer josh's initial question a high profile <laughs> vulnerability all product security teams deal with vulnerabilities and incidents every day. That's your bread and butter. But sometimes there's a situation that is either so impactful to your customer base or your corporation that you need to give it a higher level of service, kind of that white glove touch where you have a potentially dedicated personnel that help manage and coordinate the incident. You're working more extensively with your sister teams in legal and PR in your field comms. So it just, there are some types of issues and we've named several of the, the things that have happened in our memories. Uh, and there are dozens other ones, but there, there are certain things that you know are gonna end up and we all, how we like to, our litmus test is, is this gonna end up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and concern our customers, or is it going to end up on the front page of the register and piss us off? So that's you know, kind of I think we're two basic about criteria. A very important distinction as well, that the level of chaos that exists or the type of chaos or the attention that you get really differs between a product security high profile vulnerability and, a, and something that's an infrastructure um, or what is typically covered by a CSER, for example. Like I know I deal with a lot day to day that we have two different high pro profile vulnerability processes, one for infrastructure and one for products. And the criteria for what makes a high profile vulnerability does have some overlap between the two, but there's also some very distinct differences. So I think what the chaos is and how you define a high profile vulnerability 
definitely can vary depending on your context or focus of being product security versus infrastructure. We don't care about C-certs. Screw those guys. No, that's not true. <laughs> we work very closely with them. We are good partners, are especially friends. in high profile. You know what? So I, I want to go back just a screw tiny out. bit. I want to go back just a tiny bit. So we were telling us some experiences, but but Jen, I'm I'm curious, like, how do you I mean, it sounds like we're talking about there's another potential process or additions to our normal piece or process when dealing with a high profile. But how do you know when to call something that besides, okay, there's this media hype, like what are the other reasons why we might call something a high profile? Carl, do you want to go? Oh, well, I asked you, Jen. Go, she Jen. Asked you, but I would like yeah. to talk. Oh, you're, yeah. you're our expert. Come on, you I'm go. Happy to do it. Um, uh, I will yield the floor momentarily to Mr. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, as I'm training new people about high profile, um, I like to say that it's as much an art as a science. And I think um, uh, it's something that evolves with lessons learned over time with different vulnerabilities. Uh, for example, I'm trying to put together kind of a framework that <laughs> have been for months and months about weighting different factors um, to give it some transparency. But even if you have a framework, even if you have a rating system, there's always going to be combinations of factors that don't easily fit into a formula. And that's where I think experience and judgment comes in. So I look at combinations of things like, obviously we've talked about media or social media attention, right? But we, I also consider um, are there already exploits that are published that are being actively um, exploited? Um, I'm looking at the types of products within our portfolio that are impacted. Are they consumer grade, they enterprise grade where sysadmins have them behind firewalls? Um, are, I'm looking at things like, um, are we gonna have a remedy? I mean, there are cases where sometimes you can't develop a remedy. So we're looking at, are we going to ultimately have a remedy? Um, and things also, even a low scoring issue or a low impact issue, for example, sometimes will still generate very large numbers of customer inquiries. And so we want to think about, do we need to arm our sales team or our customer support teams to respond to customer inquiries? So I'm looking at all those types of things, for example, but then there's some more things that are a little more cut and dry as well, like could exploitation of this issue lead to physical harm um, or direct or indirect physical harm, like for a hospital system that is down, that people's lives re uh, rely on certain access to systems. Um, or if you're in say the automobile space where exploitation of something um, can stop a vehicle or things of that nature. I think those kind of vulnerabilities, even though they may be small um, in terms of media impact these days, because the exploitation is probably not as likely um, with you know threat actors wanting quick and dirty or high return. Um, you know, hacking an individual car, unless it's a state official, is not as exciting as you know hacking a whole fleet of cars, for example. But even though it may not get that kind of media, the fact that someone may die, um, that can make something high profile. So those are some of the things that I look at. But like I said, it's it's a real science, and I'm I don't claim to be an expert. I'm always lessons learning from prior situations. I yield the floor to Crow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, I was going to say the kind of common theme that kind of threads throughout all of our conversations we've had in the unhappy hour. When you have a high profile vulnerability management program, it's about managing risk. So yes. as Jennifer mentioned, you may have a problem that might the impact might not be great but you want to have this process in place to help both arm your employees and your staff, but also prepare your customers because your CIO may not read the Wall Street Journal or the Register, but you damn well sure most of your customers' CIOs and CFOs do, and they're going to read about it. You know, what's this 
blue heart thing I keep reading about. You know, why? When are we going to get this blue heart thing fixed? They're going to be pounding the desk. And the more prepared you are, and that's where your high profile process helps, helps you help your customer facing people empower your customers to get that information so that they can kind of suss out, you know, this really isn't a big deal. Because, you know, we've talked with researchers, you know, they have a certain set of motivations and priorities. And some of them are motivated by, you know, those monetary reasons, but also kind of, kind of that fame, trying to capture the public's eye to get to talk at a conference or, you know, publish your dissertation or your thesis. So, you know, there's motivation. So they will say some outrageous things and you might have some very creative YouTube videos that overinflate the actual mm-hmm. importance of the problem. And mm-hmm. That's, again, a, a well-tuned and mature vulnerability um, that um, high-profile vulnerability process will help you be able to cut through all that noise and provide that actual factual data that people can make their risk assessments off of. So and you're not scurrying reactively. It right. helps you be more prepared proactively. Yeah, Crope, you made me think of a, a, a few things when you were talking. You made me think of, like, when we have to make something a uh, high-profile, even though it's not necessarily like the highest risk issue or easy to, um, you know, exploit, but you still have to act like it's this urgent thing just because, you know, the media and the customers are asking about it. And it's, it's really um, a sense of like, if we can build customer trust strong enough that they understand and we can educate them to say, Hey, we're, like we're aware of this and we're addressing it for the reality of the real severity risk and we will address it in that way. And I, I think, I think that we're uh, finally on the right path after 2004, which means six years later, where we are finally able to have customers understand that there's a difference of a named one. Maybe I'm being a little, she's not a math major, Katie. What did I say? It's 2004. Oh, goodness. Oh, my goodness. Not 2014. Sorry. <laughs> I am. I got my PhD in math. That was really embarrassing. Uh, I knew what I meant. What year? Anyway, six years. Okay. Is right. we, we meant what you understood. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Totally good. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, but I, I do, I think of that. I'm like, do you think that we're like, that the customers are starting to really understand the difference a little bit? No, you don't think so? Not yet. I think personally, and this was something I struggled with when I first started my current role, is that we as industry professionals put a lot more attention and concern into media things than your average person. Um, If you're in the trades, you work with Wired or you work with a big company, yeah, you know these things. But does my grandma care about Thunderbolt or Plunderbolt or any a thousand variations of that? No, she doesn't know what it means. She skips over the article. And even if you take it down a generation or two to my non-technology savvy friends, they don't care either. And as soon as they've seen the story, they've forgotten. So I'm not so sure that it's people understand better. I'm wondering if some of it is that some people don't care and other people are just oversaturated. Well, right. No, I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt and then you guys go. So I think about Java and the, and, and I'm sorry, but Java has been around for a long time and there are every quarter they do updates and they are, there are tons of sev tens. And in the beginning it was like, Oh my God, look at all Java, sev tens, blah, blah, blah. And now it's like, Oh yep, Java did the release. It is a release. I don't know. What do you think? Okay. Katie. Java, about the normalization. Yeah. Uh, yeah, cut. yeah, Katie, go ahead. Yeah, normalization is your thing. Like, so it, when you when you never release anything and then all of a sudden you release something, it's a big deal. Like, it catches people's attention. And I also think that there's there's an element of like, it just makes no sense, right? It's just mysticism. Like, what's going to grab the attention of the community and what's not? Because like, I can't say it's based on severity because I pulled up like. Give me a give me a high level vulnerability with a, a brand, right? Because I've got three in front of me right now, and I got Blue Keep, which was a critical nine point eight, right? 
And it was bad for like a month before people calmed down. Right. And then I've got Heartbleed. Heartbleed was a 5.6. Right. Like, no, I'm sorry. It was a 7.5. It was a 7.5 was Heartbleed. And like, it's it's bad. Right. It's bad. Is it really Heartbleed that high? I don't feel like it, it was. was. That I thought high. it was a 5.0. You sure? Yeah. But like it wasn't a 10 or a 9.0. And I've got some vulnerabilities. I've had some vulnerabilities that are like make you never want to leave your house again. Like they're like, oh my God. Um, but then you look at like Meltdown Spectre. Meltdown was 5.6. Right. And my mom knew what Meltdown was because when she logged into her bank, it asked on the top of the screen, have you patched for like, and when my mom's really? like, what is Meltdown or melt spec or spec down and wow yeah could have had her watch our yeah, video no, oh, so, so katie i'm gonna correct you just a little bit the cvss version 2 score of heartbleed was a 5.0 which at that time that's what our version was so it was a medium let oh yeah yeah, had, it, yeah yeah um but you're right it, um my it's interesting when you talk about the bank account because my mom learned about heartbleed through her bank account she was logging in. It was on the top of it. So it was like when yeah. those banners started and like yeah, the top yeah. of holy cow. And that went on. Like that hype fire. went on for months and months and months. And I had to go like testify on the Hill for like what was going on and what was this? How does it affect like all the U.S. government? And but like there's a certain level of mysticism there, right? Because from our perspective as security professionals, we're like, oh, God, this thing, it's 9.9. .9 like where are the fire extinguishers because we're going to be spending all night here putting out fires and and it doesn't it's like oh it's a blip you know just oh okay well all right and there's no rhyme or reason to it and then other things are like fours and you're like i'm dealing with the the pr fallout on this one for months and it just it doesn't there's like certain level of mysticism to it and i think that most of that's probably based on external factors of what's going on it was a slow news day you know or or whatever you know there's there's a certain level of mysticism in all of this like did you make your sacrifices to the it gods today you know like i Chrome. and some things that you think are gonna go crazy are nothing burgers right they're just yep. flips no yep. we're done so so we talked Wait, about probe has been patiently waiting Oh, sorry. I, I was going to say, <laughs> part, part of the drive that I've seen, um, the sensationalized vulnerabilities, they, they cause a splash. But if you actually look at the problems, they, they may or may not be bad. They may affect a small or large population. But if you look at what threat actors are really using, they aren't leveraging these sexy video-driven things that sell T-shirts and beach balls and whatnot. That, you know, they're stealing your password. They're, they're, they're using phishing techniques. They're, most of the exploits we see are not leveraging a vulnerability. It's, you know, it's through social engineering or other you know, bad, weak passwords, that type of shit. They brute force you or they have your password. But then you know, what I've seen customers do, how the enterprise customer that we primarily service, is you have so many vulnerabilities to fixate on one or a small subset just derails that whole program because you had literally, if you are a mixed IT shop, you could have hundreds of vulnerabilities to deal with every day and you can't waste your time trying to cherry pick these one or two that has a theme song and they sell balloons. Uh, yeah, it's, you, yeah. you got to say my bank yeah. never has given me a banner that I've ever seen about a vulnerability and I'm actually glad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So I have so, a theory on why it is actually though. I at, at one point, like at one point I commissioned a study uh, at Carnegie Mellon. I wanted to compare um, actual breaches where there was a vulnerability involved, right? So we know that that's pretty rare and there's no, there's almost no data. So we ended up not being able to conduct the study, but we wanted to compare actual exploits where you can link it back to a vulnerability that was exploited for root cause and look at the severity of the vulnerability. And when we did it with the very limited amount of data that we could find a couple of isolated cases, it was very an anecdotal. So we couldn't like actually go forward with it, but it was like the fours and the fives. Those were the ones that were actually causing breaches. And my theory on this is that um, if you are a you know enterprise admin, right? And you're sitting there trying to go through 150 different things every single day, your policy probably says I patch highs and criticals. 
And so they're protected against highs and criticals and attackers will use the path of least resistance. And so they're not going to go after highs and criticals because those things are complicated. They're going to go after easy to use, well-proven exploits that people are vulnerable to because that's the avenue that's open. So the front door's open because it's a four because a sysadmin somewhere was task saturated and patched all the criticals. And somebody else has already developed the exploit that you can just go grab off the dark web and take advantage of and tweak yourself. That's my theory. Josh, you were going to say something. Yeah, I've got a question for Jen. So being that you've got experience in the industry, you've worked with a lot of other companies, you've talked to other companies, but I'm curious about... Um, Way to what, butter me up, Josh. Well, you know. <laughs> Thank you for that. Make I'm sound a <laughs> uh, What do companies do differently in handling high-profile vulnerabilities? Um, Based on your experience and what you know about other people in the industry. I think... I'm trying to think how I want to answer this. I would say a lot of the difference depends on how mature their vulnerability response program is in the first place. Mm. Um, because I feel like, um, and this may be segues saying a little bit into another topic, but um, the high profile process, I like to think of it as the icing on the cake. And it's the layers between the cake, uh, and the icing between the layers of the cake and on top of the cake, right? So you don't really change your underlying VR process. You augment it. You add some special handling on top. You accelerate some things. So if your underlying vulnerability response process is not particularly strong or clearly defined, what you might do for a high profile will very much follow that lead. Um, I say some companies, I would argue, don't really have any notion of high profile vulnerability from the proactive sense, right? It, they get notified, they react just like they would another vulnerability, but that's where the chaos factor comes in that we talked about when we started, right? Um, so I guess one thing that companies do differently is some that don't even have high profile program at all. Um, but I would say in terms of handling for ones that do, um, I think it's all about the business and what their level of risk is to take that back to what Crobe is and the nature of the customers that they have. Um, some companies have very well-defined high profile processes with dedicated roles, very specific policies um, based on severity or other factors um, that they execute on. Um, one company I've worked at actively works with PR and social media, whereas another company, um, certain people had avenues into PR and social media, but entire pieces of the company didn't really participate in PCER and they were kind of rogue. Um, so there was a corporate team, but some of the business units kind of did their own thing, right? Um, so I don't think there's an easy way to answer that in specifics because it really depends on your process that's underlying in the first place and how mature that is, at least in my experience. I wonder if this also goes back to, it goes back to, you know, how you define the security vulnerability or excuse me, a high profile vulnerability when you were, you're talking about, you know, a set of criteria that you have that you establish and that always changes that, you know, that always evolves. But even then, you you as or at least some companies have they're prepared for it in a way that allows them to um, to adapt much easier than others, right? If you're not thinking about that, so right. Um, anybody have anything else to add? Well, I I, I think oh my gosh, all, first wall we've ever had. I know, right? Exactly. I think all that we said is is really important. Like you said, like. I, I think what things interesting is, is that not every, um, like I might not have the same definition of high profile, my company that I would in your company or your company, you really have to understand your business line and your, your business risk and customer base and, and all that. So that's, that's sort of interesting. Um, I also think in general, like we've been talking about your regular, PCER process um, should be able to handle the majority of this. You just might have to have extra tweaks in it 
because you might have to speed up your your um you know your SLOs. You might have to involve PR or legal more than what you normally would. You might have to do potentially a pre-notification because it's already in the wild. Where before you would wait until you actually address the issue. Come on, Crobe. I know you're talking about it, but you might have some banners on the top like some other companies do. For well, sure, when it's public, yeah, it's great. Yeah, when it's public. I'm. Oh, of course, when it's public. If it's not public. Right. It's not a good industry practice to communicate about it. But if it's public, you know, it's not worth trying to hide. It's worth trying to say, yes, we're aware because uh, there's a lot of costs that comes in from customer support. And we want customers and I'm not worried just about the cost, but because I want to have customers have transparency into what we're doing. But I don't want to waste money. I don't want to waste my customers time. I don't want to waste my support's time. And so if I could give that information up front, especially when it's a public issue, I certainly want to want to do it. Um, But all these are sort of tweaks to the PSERT process and not necessarily like, you know, a, a derailment of a, a normal process. Um, I just realized I thought Josh asked an entirely different question than what was I was answering. <laughs> you I answered a great question, though. Yeah, you did. You answered the question I should have asked. Yes. Well, I think Lisa's answering the, the better question, even though we had a little overlap, which is how do you handle high profiles differently in general? And I was thinking in terms of how do different companies specifically compare and contrast the company's handling of high profile versus comparing and contrasting high profiles versus regular vulnerabilities, right? Well, that- both topics we need to discuss though, Jen. So, so yeah. all yep. good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just tied it all together somehow. Um, yeah, well, that's what you do. You tie yeah. things together. Yeah. Put little bows on them. Yeah. So, so I think, uh, Josh, I think we're almost out of time. I think we have some like yeah. last two minute like questions yep. to ask Jen. Do you want to? do that no you go ahead go oh ahead. me look at this okay so um if if i'm a, a company and um i'm looking at how to best prepare for situations like this jen what are your what are your key things that you would tell them to do uh you're talking like at um you know like if to establish a program in the first place or very specifics within a program what let's just say anything let's just say what if i'm a company and i'm i'm going to approach a high profile what should i have in place what should i be doing what should i continually be looking at because i think in this world we're our processes are never they're not very good enough we always are evolving so so start from like basics to to you know i'm a big successful corporate company that already has a policy so try to give us different angles. Um, so I think one key aspect is you should have, um, you should establish if you don't already have it, um, some sort of foundational playbook or process or procedure um, that's the basics, right? What is it? Take your first stab at what are my, what is my criteria going to be? Um, if you're establishing this from the beginning, it's useful to work with your business and corporate teams to understand their risk tolerance, to help you mold that criteria to what's appropriate for your business. Um, And then from there, take that and start thinking about what's my playbook so that you have like this basic place to start in a repeatable fashion that sure you can customize as you go, uh, because as Katie's word was sometimes it's mystic (laughs) or (laughs) mystifying. Um, And as I say, it's kind of an art. Sure, you can adapt that playbook, you can adapt your process, but you don't wanna be figuring out, oh my gosh, what do I do at the last minute? So having that as a foundational start that you can repeat every time and you can do lessons learned after um, you have a particular, you don't necessarily have to do one every time, but if you have a unique search situation or something that was particularly challenging, um, things come up that you didn't expect, that's a great opportunity to do lessons learned and then go back and refine your playbooks or your processes. Um, similarly uh, related to refining your process, 
Um, one of the things that I'm starting to do is this year we've we've got our list of everything that we identified as high profile. Um, take a look at what was your rationale for why you declared something high profile in the first place or why you rejected a candidate to be high profile and then look at what happened in that circumstance and see, do I need to tweak my criteria? Do I need to tweak my um, or augment things for those circumstances where, gosh, we were so worried that it was a nothing burger. Is it okay that it was a nothing burger or do I have enough nothing burgers that I need to reevaluate my cr criteria? Maybe I'm being overly um, cautious about things, right? Or maybe things are slipping through that we should have made high profile because I was too stringent in my criteria, right? And it, so it all goes back to our risk, appetite, and that can change with the business. So I think having your playbook uh, based on your first data criteria, then refine, refine, refine with lessons learned. Um, those are some of the things that I would make sure um, that any company should do. As Please, do you have anything you want to add or Josh? No, we were all Excellent. nodding like Jen, we were all nodding. You, you were exact on like about everything. If you keep us all quiet, like, and we're not adding two cents in, like, that's sort of amazing. Yeah, you really yeah, brought you us know, home I there. tend to ramble sometimes and just don't take a breath. No, uh, ama amazing, Jen, amazing advice. You, you were right on the money, and it, it really brought us home to, you know, to help. I think this, this is going to help a lot of people who deal with these high profiles or haven't had the experience that we have to really uh, be more responsive and less reactive and... <laughs> Um, build better models that serve their customers in a more effective way. So, oh, one more thing about that. Look at your underlying VR process too when you're doing your lessons learned. High profile will identify the gaps in your underlying VR process or PCERT process. Um, things that you think you can rely on happening, you're going to find the gaps and, and use that as a circular feedback window, like how we like to feedback. PCERT findings back to secure development and complete that circle. Do that with your PCERT process too um, to help shore that up because as that shores up, it makes your high profile process easier to manage if it truly is an augment versus a replacement for your baseline PCERT. Excellent. Well, folks, thank you, Jen. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. It's been really a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks and for having everybody me. who uh, is listening in, please uh, tune in next week and we'll have more great stuff for you to learn from. So, thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.